A reading of John 21, verses 15 through 20. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you, um, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one, had, the one who had been reclining at, ta- at the at table close to him and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the, the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. The word of the Lord. It is a frightful thing to ascend this podium. Those of you who have been here know what it's like, and I am now sympathetic with those who have laid hold of the head of Chrysostom during their lectures or their sermons. But I am grateful to be here, and I'm grateful to you, Dean George and Dr. Taylor, and all of the faculty here at Beeson for all that you have given to me. And I'm thankful to all of my classmates and friends for all that you have taught me in your graciousness, in your love for our Lord, for Christ. So pray with me before we begin. Late have we loved you, Lord Christ, O beauty so ancient and so new. Late have we loved you. Our souls cling to the dust. Would you give us life according to your word? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? This question was the question that my heart has been burdened by, by this text as I've been preparing to preach today. Jesus poses this same question to Peter three times in a row, and I believe that today Jesus poses this question by the power of his Spirit to each of us sitting here in this room. Do you love me? This question is the most important question, the most consequential question, not only for our qualification to serve as shepherds in the flock of Jesus Christ, but also for the holiness and the wholeness of all of our souls. Jesus does not ask us, thank the Lord, were you admitted to Beeson Divinity School. He does not ask us what our GPA was. He doesn't ask us how well we did in Dr. Ross's Hebrew 3. He doesn't ask us how well we can recognize and categorize Greek participles or Hebrew hollow verbs. He doesn't ask us what Zwingli's greatest fear was or which Gregory it was that penned a specific quote on the Trinity. He doesn't ask us how many people in our church appreciated and enjoyed our last sermon or how many times we got live tweeted. He doesn't even ask us whether those coveted letters MDiv appear after our name on official documents. No, what Jesus asks us today, do you love me, is at once easier and far more difficult. 
It is easier than recalling the difference between Nazianzus and Nyssa. It is easier than spotting a nominative singular present participle instead of a genitive plural noun. And it is impossibly difficult. It is impossibly difficult because the only kind of person who can answer this question rightly is a person who has already died. A person who has already been brought utterly to the end of themselves and to the end of their self-confidence. And this self-confidence, this self-dependence that is the antithesis of love, the antithesis of the correct answer to our question today, it poses a terrible and a corrosive danger to all of our souls. If left untreated, the malady of self-confidence will consume you. It will eat you up like a metastatic cancer until you become a supremely competent and a supremely qualified and a supremely damned monster. You and I, all of us here who are students and friends and faculty at Beeson Divinity School, stand in danger of this cancerous malady of self-confidence. We are not unlike our brothers and sisters in the church at Ephesus to whom Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Oh, my friends, my Besanites, Jesus knows your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. He knows that you cannot bear with those who are evil, how you have tested many innovators in doctrine and found them to be false. He knows your patient endurance, and he knows that you have not grown weary. But I fear that he also has this against you and against me. That we depend on our many accomplishments and our competencies and we have abandoned the love that we had at first. We are filled with that cancer of self-confidence. And so what I want to propose to you today is that Jesus in his infinite kindness is offering to us a cure for our cancer, a cure for our self-confidence. And the cure for our self-confidence is love, love that is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, love that draws us to a crucified Lord who rose again on the third day, love that adopts us and brings us home to the Father forever. And so with that danger of self-confidence in mind today, I want to draw three observations out of our text. First, I want us to observe the prerequisite for ministry, which is love. Not self-confidence or qualification or competence, but love. Second, I want us to observe the cost of a ministry that is fueled by love. And third, I want us to observe the source of the love that fuels ministry, no matter what the cost is. So if you would, walk with me through these verses at the end of the Gospel of John, and let us observe the prerequisite for ministry, which is love. As we walk through these verses, I want us to recall also some key scenes from earlier in John's Gospel and see what Jesus has been doing for Peter and for us to quench our self-confidence and to kindle our love. Look again with me at verses 15 through 17. This exchange is well known to us. It's very famous. But I want you to imagine the scene, picture the scene. Peter and the beloved disciple and several others had been fishing all night long. And all night long they had failed to catch anything. They had been laboring in their boat through the dark hours of the night. And nothing had come in. And at dawn they stood, they saw on the seashore... They saw Jesus standing, and Jesus had prepared a meal for them, and after this miraculous catch of fish, they all end up on the beach sharing a meal with Jesus. 
And I don't know if you've ever shared a meal in hospitality with good friends after a long night of labor, but there comes a moment at the end of those meals, a moment of satisfied and somnolent and happy silence. And into that moment of silence, Jesus asked Peter the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter says, yes, Lord, you you know that I love you. Jesus says again, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter, perhaps by this time, that somnolence is wearing off as he realizes something is up. And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, tend my sheep. And then again, a third time, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter, by this time wounded, says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. The story, I think, is so familiar to us that it can be easy to miss what's going on. I want to ask you, does Jesus know something new at the end of this exchange with Peter that he didn't know at the beginning? Of course not. Peter says it himself, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. So if Jesus doesn't learn something new here, if Jesus isn't gaining information by this exchange, we have to ask ourselves that most useful of hermeneutical questions, which is, what is going on here? I think the key to understanding this text is understanding that in John's gospel, numbers are very important. The whole book of John's gospel is structured around seven signs that Jesus performed, and they're recorded, John tells us, not because they're the only signs, the only miracles that Jesus performed, but he selects seven signs. John tells us in chapter 20, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This seven signs is important. So these numbers are important. Now here in chapter 21, we have three questions, or the same question three times, addressed to Peter. And the question that we should be asking as alert readers of the text who are not asleep after a breakfast on the beach, the question we should be asking is what else in John's gospel happens three times? Now the answer, of course, is Peter's triple denial of Jesus. Three times on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Peter is asked, you're not one of his disciples, are you? And each time, Peter denies it. He denies his Lord, whom he loves. He denies him of whom he confessed, you are the Christ. He denies the one to whom he said, you have the words of eternal life, to whom else shall we go? He denies him. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record for us that immediately after the third denial, when the rooster crowed, Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Luke even tells us that in that moment, as the words of Peter's third denial were still hanging in the air, the Lord turned and looked at him across the courtyard, made eye contact with him. Friends, this Peter is a man who has been brought to the end of himself. Let me tell you something. You and I are exactly like Peter. We will never be fully fit for ministry until we are likewise brought to the end of ourselves. If you flash back in your Bibles to that upper room discourse in John chapter 13, when Jesus predicts Peter's denial, Peter says, Lord, I will follow you. I will lay down my life for you. But what Peter really meant in that moment was, Lord, I will follow you as long as you really are about to inaugurate the kingdom in victory like I think. And I get to be there with you every glorious step of the way. Peter said, I will follow you, but what he really meant was, I will follow you if you take me where I want to go. If you're like me, and I think most of you are, you may say to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you into this call to ministry. I will follow you as your servant, and I will build up your church. But what you really mean is, Lord, I will follow you as long as you lead me 
to a comfortably large church with generous givers and maybe a book deal a few years down the road. Or maybe you say, Lord, I will follow you as long as you don't lead me overseas. Or Lord, I will follow you as long as you lead me exactly where I want to go. Friends, do you see what a barrier to genuine ministry this is? There was an ambition and a self-confidence and a self-directiveness that was mixed in with Peter's love for Jesus and his genuine desire to follow him. It couldn't be separated out on its own. Only the hot coals of that fire in the, in the high priest's courtyard where Peter denied the Lord three times, only those hot coals revealed the condition of his heart. That fire burned out the impurity of Peter's ambition and his self-confidence, and it left him cold and uncertain. So Peter needed another fire to rekindle his love. He needed the coals of a fire on a Galilean beach with a hot meal prepared by the wounded hands of a thrice-denied, slain, and now resurrected rabbi. He needed his love rekindled by the one who said in John chapter 15, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. This love is the prerequisite for Peter's ministry, for his life, just as it is for your ministry and your life. Peter needed this kind of unshakable love, a love not rooted in Peter's loyalty and his ambition or in his own merely natural affection. He needed a love that could not be destroyed because it was rooted ultimately in the eternal love of the triune God, the love with which the Father loves the Son and the Son loves his people and kindles their love by the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. And we are just the same in order to be fully fit for ministry. What we need is the eternal love of God. We need to die to our self-confidence and our ambition, die to our caveats upon the ministerial call, and come only to Jesus, saying, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I want to try to be crystal clear here. I'm not saying that everyone needs to have some kind of dramatic or traumatic experience of near apostasy and denying of Jesus in order to be fit for ministry. If preparing for ministry were some kind of competition about the drama of our call narratives, we can all go home and quit because Peter wins. It doesn't get more dramatic than Jesus Christ himself locking eyes with you right after you've denied him for the third time. You couldn't write a plot more dramatic than that. So don't go doubting your call to ministry because you haven't suffered an experience like that. It's not about the drama of the experience. Here's what I am saying. In order to be effective in ministry, we need to recognize in our hearts that we have tendencies of self-confidence like Peter. And we need to come to the end of our self-confidence until all our hope and all of our love is rooted in Jesus. Ritterboss, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, points out to us that when Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Peter has come to a point in his life where he has nothing left on which to base his claim to love Jesus. He can base his appeal on nothing except the infinite knowledge of the one who knows him completely. Peter can no longer say, yes, Lord, I have followed you from the beginning when you called me. Or, yes, Lord, I love you. I am Peter, that stony and solid Galilean fisherman. I confess you as the Christ. No, Peter can't say any of that anymore. Peter can only say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter's appeal is rooted now all and only in the person of Jesus Christ. As we noted before, Jesus doesn't learn anything new from this exchange. Jesus is not reassuring himself of Peter's love as though Jesus could be insecure in the affections of his disciple. No, three times in a row, Jesus is reassuring Peter of his love. 
the threefold denial of that dark night of betrayal is met and washed away completely by a threefold confession in the bright morning on the Sea of Galilee. The prerequisite for ministry is love. Now second, I want us to observe the cost of ministry that is fueled by love. Look with me again at your Bibles at verses 18 to 19. Jesus says to Peter, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Friends, if you would give yourself completely to the ministry that is fueled by this love from the triune God, it will cost you everything. It will cost you your self-reliance and your self-confidence. It will cost you your freedom to determine where you live and your autonomy over the course of your career. It may even cost you your actual freedom. You may extend your hands and be bound by another and led where you do not wish to go. I think that you and I particularly need to hear this because it is so easy even today in the Bible Belt in Alabama to convince ourselves that we are bound for a professional, comfortable career. Maybe you think that because of your resume and your references, you will easily get a job at just the sort of church where you want to work. Or maybe you think that because of your GPA and your writing samples, you will get into exactly the PhD program that you desire. Or maybe you're tempted to think that because your spouse is in a good career field, you will be comfortable and exempt from the suffering and the challenges of ministry. Brothers and sisters, these are the values of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and not the values of the kingdom of God. Let me tell you something about the nature of reality. A crucified and resurrected lamb reigns as king over the whole universe. And if you would share in his ministry, you will not be exempt from sharing in his sufferings. There is a lamb standing as though slain in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures. He died, and behold, he lives evermore. The values of his kingdom are a complete reversal of the values of the world. In terms of the kingdom of heaven, Peter was more free when he was bound by someone else and clothed as a prisoner than he ever was when he clothed himself and he walked wherever he wished. When he was young, Peter carried a sword for self-defense, but when he was old, he carried a cross and he testified to the love of his Savior. And I tell you, he was safer carrying that cross than he ever was carrying the sword. Make no mistake, the ministry that is fueled by love will cost you everything. And because that ministry will cost you everything, nothing else will do as a source for that love other than the love of God, which is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which draws us to follow and share in the sufferings of a crucified and risen Savior, and which adopts us into the family of God and brings us home to the Father forever. No other love will do. Loving the church for the recognition that it can give you won't do. Loving the job for the benefits certainly won't do. Loving seminary because you love books and ideas and well-crafted arguments will not do. Even loving the people won't do unless it is rooted ultimately in the love of God. And maybe you hear this and you say, how? How then? How can I will myself into loving Jesus? On top of all my other seminary work, my projects, my papers, my assignments, do I have to seize myself by the volitional bootstraps and somehow lift myself into loving Jesus? Am I laying on your shoulders now a burden of love as some kind of cognitive act, some kind of works salvation, a burden that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? 
I say no. Look again in your mind's eye at where Peter and Jesus are. Look at where they're sitting on the beach, having just finished eating a meal prepared by the hand of the resurrected Lord. You can look at Peter sitting by the fire, his garments still steaming away the water they absorbed when he literally threw himself into the sea to get to Jesus more quickly. But I want to point something out to you. In this scene, before Peter saw Jesus, Jesus was already waiting for him on the beach. Before Peter threw himself into the sea, Jesus had already laid a fire to dry Peter's clothes and to warm his soul. So I tell you, friends, come to Jesus. You don't need to stir up your love for him as though you could. Jesus has already come to you. If you belong to him and are called by his name, he already loves you. If you grew up in the church, you imbibed this with your mother's milk. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He has set his seal upon you in the waters of baptism. As our brother Luther said, remember your baptism. He loves you with a love that is stronger than death. This ministry of the gospel may cost you everything. You may die and be laid in the earth there to be eaten by worms. But the love and the power of God which resurrected Christ Jesus from the dead will resurrect also your mortal bodies. You will stand on the earth in the last day and you will see your Redeemer who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. So every morning with the dawn, as you come to the end of another dark and exhausting night of the labor of ministry, look to the shore. See Jesus waiting for you. Come to him and warm yourself at his fire. Feast on him because only those who are fed by the chief shepherd are able to feed the sheep. And keep on feasting on him and feeding his lambs until that day when the lamb returns and he shepherds us and he guides us to springs of living water and he wipes away every tear from the eyes of those who have longed to see him and feast on him forever. Amen.